Hi everyone, I'm Chin Mejani, uh, Hematology Oncology Fellow at University of Miami, and we are here in San Francisco for ASCO GU 2025 uh, tonight at uh, Ong Brothers event, and I'm here with Dr. Zhang from UTSW uh, talking about prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Zhang, if you can please introduce yourself. Sure. I'm Tian Zhang. I'm a GU medical oncologist and associate director of clinical research at Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Really happy to be here. Thanks a lot, Dr. Zhang. And I guess the first question that comes to my mind uh, that I'm trying to treat prostate cancer patients uh, is about PSMA PET scans. So with um, more and more access for PSMA PET scans, what is your current practice of utilizing PSMA PET scans in early stage disease as well as in metastatic disease? How do you utilize it and uh, what's your guideline? Sure. Um, often uh, these patients are coming to me uh, with PSMA positive disease. Uh, often it's a urologist that has sent it because their PSA is high or they had some lymph node that looked big on a standard CT. Um, and so I'm seeing patients mostly in um, high-risk localized disease setting. Um, if in their, they're in the biochemical recurrent setting of PSA rising, um, I'm often getting those PSMA PETs after their PSA is over 0.5 or so, and with a doubling time um, that's rather short, um, less than six months, sometimes less than a year, um, if patients are really um, wanting to, to look. Um, it is an earlier disease setting of early metastatic disease, PSMA positive disease, especially those that don't have CT or bone scan correlates. Um, so I do also obtain a bone scan to make sure especially in the de novo metastatic disease setting, um, that people don't have bone scan correlates. Um, if it's purely PSMA PET positive, then um, we're often talking through what does micrometastatic disease look like. Um, we have a series at UT Southwestern that uh, these patients actually do very well. Their time to castration resistance is quite long. They're living a long time. Um, you know, these patients are the ones set up um, where they respond very uh, well to hormone deprivation, often will um, intensify treatment, um, and um, and they uh, they do brilliantly. Their PSA responds, and they um, uh, are often the ones um, two years down the road where we're talking about maybe we can hold their treatment um, and give them some treatment-free intervals. And to that question, I guess, uh, great in, great insight about mentioning about bone scan as well, when as and when needed, and not just completely sticking to PSM PET scan when it's uh, necessary. Uh, you mentioned about um, treatment break. So can you give more insights about when do you select these treatment breaks? Uh, what are those patient population, and how long do you like, prefer for those things? Sure. So I've always been a um, utilizer of intermittent hormone deprivation therapy. Mm -hmm in the biochemical recurrent space. Um, so I do, you know, give about a year of hormone deprivation, then I hold. Um, for the patients who have PSMA avid disease, I'm often doing two years, and then mm -hmm. we're holding um, if their PSA is undetectable. Um, and then, you know, if their PSA is rising with a doubling time less than six months, that's when I will re-challenge. Um, in terms of um, patients uh, with de novo metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. We actually um, had a global trial called Libertas. Um, it was a, uh, a trial run by Johnson Johnson that um, looked at all patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, treated them with ADT and apalutamide, and at six months, if people were doing well, um, the hormone deprivation, they were randomized to either stopping the hormone deprivation and continuing on apalutamide or continuing on the doublet. And so um, that trial actually has a poster here at GU ASCO. Um, and there is um, some data that shows excellent PSA responses in that patient cohort. 70% um, of folks had PSAs uh, less than 0 0.2 at six months. And then um, another 17% um, additionally had um, more than that 70, so total 87% um, had PSA declines of 50% or more. Um, so, you know, it, it's really an interesting data um, for that six month cutoff for the randomization. And um, we'll look forward to seeing that data read out um, about whether or not patients can hold their hormone deprivation. So talking about biochemical recurrence, um, 
we have patients coming to our clinics and asking, my PSA is going, but like, doctor, are you going to act or something? Are you going to give me some treatment? So what is your guideline for just biochemical recurrence patients? Um, you know, I, I often say, you know, PSA doubling time is an important measure of disease activity. Yes, the PSA is also a good marker. And so um, we're often following those patients in that biochemical recurrence space. And, um, and you know, I give a lot of reassurance um, and say this is a very sensitive biomarker. Um, but if it, that doubling time is less than six months, um, then we go ahead with more workup, with more treatment. If it's more than six months, more than a year, you know, we have a lot of good data to show that um, those patients are, you know, have indolent disease, they're not likely to die from prostate cancer. And so um, I have a lot of equipoise to hold off. Um, and most patients, they're not really eager to sign up for, you know, all the side effects of hormone deprivation. So we, we talk through that and we keep track of them. Yeah. Um, and it, usually, uh, that goes well or well. What future therapies or novel therapies are you really excited about for prostate cancer? Um, we have a number of, um, exciting agents, um, coming through in the castration resistance setting. Um, there are some novel targets like um, B7H3, um, antibody drug conjugates that are looking really active. Um, there are some bispecifics with PSMA, CD3, steep one CD3. Um, there's also a KLK2 uh, CD3 bispecific. So those are looking really exciting. Um, and then there are some novel radial ligands too, um, using actinium as the backbone. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the um, potential for novel therapies is quite um, exciting and hopefully um, we'll have newer treatments to come for our um, patients with prostate cancer. I guess more as more and more data is coming, prostate cancer future seems to be very bright for various different landscapes, whether it's early stage disease to metastatic disease. So thanks a lot, Dr. Zhang, for all your insights. Hopefully so. Thank you.